Hey, Jude. What's up? Good. How are you? How are you doing? Good so far. <laughs> <laughs> finally present, huh? Yeah. Finally get it done. Presentation. Hmm? It's ahead of you. Oh. <laughs> nice. How was your weekend? Good. I I rehearsed a lot of things. Oh, good. And yeah. I prepared also resident interview questions. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're like the standard questions. Interview questions? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, but like, I cannot prepare for everything. But I found a list of the 40 most common asked um, questions, so I prepared them. Yeah. I still need to rehearse a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. You get the last version. I, of I did the one okay. this morning. Yeah. Night or something. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Okay. But I, uh, I, I, this should be it. Is there anything you want me to check? Maybe we can uh, see him present us. To Go quickly through all slides. Yeah. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah, that's good though. <laughs> this is a lot of this work you did in Michigan, right? Before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This should be out. Slide. Can you hide it? Hide it, maybe. Yeah, I think that's the only thing I changed. And I also changed in the pre in this slide. I um, made these letters um, big, the E in capital E. Mm -hmm. And after. Yeah. I downloaded this one. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> minutes is really short to get through all of it. Wait, he said 15 minutes? I thought, I thought he said 30 originally. Yeah, originally, yes, and then it got short and short. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, yeah, I tried to make it. Okay, so oh, thank you. You gave me a lot of tips. <laughs> 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 nice, nice. Oh, I got a Twitter handle. Nice. That's a yeah, classic I move at the end. Not yeah. a lot, but <laughs> <laughs> just Okay. All right, let me just log into Zoom for us. <laughs> Already. Um, oh. right. So it shared. That's fine. Yeah. I think I can see it already here.
Is it muted or unmuted? It's unmuted, right? I'm actually not presenting, it's a uh, this title, but it's okay. These are presenting. Can you do this? Only 15 minutes. <laughs> well, you have enough time, right? <laughs> here. Let me make sure we're on time. Mm -hmm. Can you figure out what you're going to present? Yeah, I'll do the uh, eight. Okay, good.
always going to need a sword. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that right now. Jets and giants are cheesy. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's just uh, some students is going to present, okay. and then some of the NFTs are going to present their their property answers. Kind of smattering, I think, before the uh, EUA deadline. Okay. Some of them are applying for residency, so it's good for them to try to get their their and talks for their sub eyes. Applying next year. Judith is applying this year. Can I get started? Yeah, sure. So so Judith is uh is in Neil Bander's lab and um did a residency. You completed the residency in Vienna, right? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so so did most of the residency mm -hmm. with Sharok and uh, worked at the University of Michigan with Ganesh before joining Neil and um, has done a little bit of research here with me. But she's going to talk about uh, a lot of the work that she's done at Michigan and with Cheryl Lee at Ohio State. She's also mm -hmm. applying for residency training with the goal of being an academic urologist here in the U.S. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to talk about uh, body composition and its importance in geriatric urologic oncology, which was part of my doctoral project. I have no disclosures. Uh, the presentation will have three parts, introduction, current literature, and strategies for prevention and treatment of an altered body composition. The problem that we face in medicine is that we deal with an aging population and the comorbidities that come along with that. Also, most adult cancer types increase in incidence with age. A, a comprehensive geriatric assessment is done in a multidisciplinary team. However, this takes a lot of time and a lot of personnel. Up to a quarter of individuals of 65 years or older can be characterized as frail. There are different assessment methods. A common one to assess frailty is the phenotype model, which includes shrinking, weakness, exhaustion, slowness, like slow walking speed, and uh, low physical activity. The definition of older varies from culture to culture. Most of the literature concentrates on the population of 65 years and older, where in general the prevalence of uh, frailty starts to increase. This graph uh, depicts the, the frailty score ranging from 0 to 5. Five, sorry, um, and uh, and um, so you can see, for example, for a person um, that is 50 years old, uh, a frailty has a different meaning to a person who is a non-agerian. So in geriatric oncology, it's biological age that determines the management. General frailty is a state of vulnerability with a poor res response to recovery after a stressful event. Can be also said they these are people who have, who have like a low resilience. Sarcopenia is the biological substrate of physical frailty, and it's present in about five to ten percent of persons of 65 years and older. Sarcopenia is the progressive and also generalized skeletal uh, mis uh, disorder that is associated with an increased likelihood of adverse outcomes such as falls, fractures, loss of quality of life, physical disability, and mortality. So what happens during aging is the prevalence of sarcopenia, which you can see in the pink column, and the sarcopenic obesity, uh, these populations increase with age. The prevalence of people who are purely obese, which you can see in the yellow column, decline. But what is likely is that some of the obese individuals simply convert to sarcopenic obesity later in life. Age, there is a decline in hormone production an increase in inflammation and inactivity that actually leads to further buildup of fat, and this is like a low state of inflammation, a chronic state of inflammation. And in one extreme of the spectrum, people have low muscle mass and low fat uh, and high fat mass, and this combination is called sarcopenic obesity. Other age-related changes are a decrease in muscle protein, and stem cells, mitochondrial dysfunction, and bone breakdown. The sign of the muscle function is the combination of a decreased mass of the muscle and a decreased strength. 
cancer additionally aggravates the tissue loss, which makes it more prevalent in this population. It affects neuronal pathways that control feeding behavior and energy homeostasis. The lipolysis and the free fatty acid that get mobilized and they can um, make like an exotopic fat deposition, for example, they can go in the muscle and um, make um, um, make basically the muscle weaker. Uh, the muscle becomes weak and then is also insulin resistant. Lastly, the liver over produces inflammation promoting acute phase protein at the expense of structural protein. If we reflect how the FDA NIH defines a biomarker, body composition is actually very promising because it's individual in every single patient and can be influenced by many factors. First, by aging, second, by diseases such as malignancies, and third, by external factors such as medication. Relative health is usually assessed in clinic with an eyeball test, the ASA physical status, or the BMI. However, analytic morphomics allow us to distinguish between different compartments of the body, organ size, and the condition of organs, or a condition of the muscle, for example. There are different methods to assess for example, with a DEXA scan, uh, bioelectrical impedance, and uh, cross-sectional imaging. Performing is the path to personal is a path to personalized medicine and has the power to stratify patients and potentially predict how they will perform before, during, and after treatment. It may also inform pharmacological studies. Patients with cancer, CT scans are normally readily available and are actually a rich source of data. An established anatomic landmark is the third lumbar vertebral section, which has been demonstrate, demonstrated previously um, to be significantly correlated with the whole body um, skeletal as well as adipose tissue mass. There are several medical image analysis softwares that perform a semi-automatically tissue demarcation within their specific council units. In that way, the areas for skeletal muscle, the subcutaneous fat area, and the visceral fat area can be measured. In the current literature, the most commonly used definitions are gender-specific and based on the skeletal muscle index or the fluid muscle index, calculated by the specific muscle area divided or adjusted by the body size, normally it's height squared. If you add the BMI to the definition, it allows you to assess uh, or sarcopenic obesity. Now I would like to move on to the literature part. In biologic oncology, sarcopenia has been widely researched, especially in the population of cystectomy because it's a very morbid uh, procedure and can also go along with mortality. This work compiles data from five retrospective cohort studies, including almost 1,500 individuals. About a third of those were classified as sarcopenic. The primary study endpoints were cancer-specific and all-cause mortality. Overall, the median follow-up across the included studies was about 40 months, and in the pooled analysis, cancer-specific and overall mortality after cystectomy were increased in the sarcopenic individuals. This incentive to evaluate if sarcopenia is predictive for computations after cystectomy. In this study, we performed a retrospective analysis of 441 individuals treated at the UFM. We studied the psoas muscle as it has main functions that are important for the human being to move by bipedal locomotion. Consistent with the previous literature, about a third could be classified as sarcopenic. Um, was more prevalent in patients over 65 years and older. Um, of note, the median BMI in this cohort was 28. We looked at early and intermediate complication rates and found that an increase in BMI was associated with the development of early complications. On the contrary, an increase in the total psoas area, which is the surrogate parameter for the muscle mass, was associated with lower odds of morbidity. Hence, regular assessment of body composition before cystectomy could be a step towards personalized risk assessment. Similarly important in this population are frailty and the preoperative nutritional status. Free frail or frail individuals are more prone to develop major complications 
being discharged to a nursing facility or rehab and have an increased uh, risk for short-term mortality. An abnormal high BMA, uh, BMI and preoperative hypoalbuminemia were associated with an increased risk of early complication. Also, low albumin levels were predictive of a worse three-year overall survival. Guideline for enhanced recovery in cystectomy is a perioperative approach to manage our patients. Application has been shown to be a, um, beneficial for multiple outcomes. When reviewing 48 publications that reported about an enhanced strategy for recovery, we found that the median adherence rate for preoperative elements was 82%, but as you can see in the spider chart, there's little application of element number two, which is the preoperative medical optimization that also includes preoperative nutritional support. Moving on to urologic cancers in general, the work included individuals with all sorts of tumors in different stages, most data was available for bladder cancer. Studies were included and they analyzed data of more than 2,000 individuals. Primary endpoints were cancer specific and all um, cause mortality. Overall, sarcopenia was associated with an increased cancer specific and all mortality, and the author suggested it may serve as a prognostic marker. During the literature for prevalence and prognostic impact of sarcopenic obesity, reveals that there are 15 publications in this field, most of them including individuals with bladder and kidney cancer. The majority of the studies were performed in the United States. More than a quarter of included subjects could be classified as, as sarcopenic and obese. The association between sarcopenic obesity and survival was mixed, but most data was indicating that, indicating that um, sarcopenic obesity with a shorter survival time. As in the review studies before, one, lim one limitation must be kept in mind. There are different measurements and definitions used, which makes the generalization and conclusion drawing difficult. So what can we do? Urologic task forces propose the use of a simplified version for frailty screening in the elderly with the sequential use of two established tools. First, the minicog to assess for competence to make decisions. It should be followed by the G8 questionnaire asking for food intake, weight loss, mobility, etc. This allows to see if there's further need to assess and also to see if the condition is reversible. In elderly cancer patients, there is an additional screening uh, that might be needed. Case finding is particularly relevant in settings where a higher prevalence of sarcopenia can be expected. This chart shows the algorithm for case finding, diagnosis, confirmation, and staging of sarcopenia in practice. For urologists, being aware and the ability to screen for this condition is most important. Screening can, can be done clinically or with a questionnaire. <coughs> the SARC-F is a five-item questionnaire that is self-reported by patients as a screen for sarcopenia risk. Responses are based on the patient's perception of limitations in strength, uh, walking ability, rising from a chair, climbing stairs, or experiences with falls. To assess for sarcopenic obesity in elderly cancer patients, an additional effort is needed. The algorithm here consists of screening for both conditions. First, the sarcopenia screening as presented before, and second, assessment of BMI or waist circumference. Again, for urologists, awareness and the ability to screen is most important. The prevention of sarcopenia is a major area of research. The so-called life course approach suggests that the tissue loss of older people does not only depend on the rate of functional decline that happens later in life. Functional peak is reached in young adulthood, which is in turn uh, determined by factors such as birth weight and pre-pubertal and pubertal growth. So the largest opportunity lies in primary prevention with intervention at a younger age. However, in the immediate uro-oncologic care in the hospital setting, we deal with generally older population that is at risk or might already suffer from tissue loss. And physicians should be aware of this fact and aim for early detection of an altered body composition 
and if present, try to work out the counter strategy with the Objectives of clinical care is maintaining the functional independence and quality of life, and at the same time also avoiding unnecessary admissions to the hospital or long-term care facilities. Coming now to treatment strategies, cannot stop aging for sure. Nevertheless, a modifiable patient factor is the amount of physical activity, which is the cornerstone of the treatment. In sarcopenic obesity, calorie restriction is recommended, and another option could be bariatric surgery. Underlying pathogenic processes must be treated as well. An adequate protein intake is also recommended, as well as the deprescription of inappropriate medications in elderly. No specific drugs have been uh, approved for the treatment of sarcopenia, but there are ongoing trials. I want to end this presentation with some takeaway messages. The topic is important as an altered body composition is prevalent in the elderly population, and it even becomes more important as the elderly will dominate the future practice. More initiatives are necessary to educate um, urologic oncologists and integrate geriatrics into usual practice and services. Critically, more older centered studies with harmonized definitions and appropriate endpoints are necessary to provide the basis for more specific uh, treatment standards. These are my references. I want to thank the departments of urology in Vienna and in Ann Arbor as well as the Morphomics Analysis Group of UFM, who supported me in the development of my thesis project. Also, Dr. Bender for having me in his lab, moving forward another field of personalized medicine, namely the PSMA targeted therapy. And I want to thank Dr. Hu and Alec for reviewing the presentation up front and for mentoring. Thank you all for uh, your attention, and I would be happy to take any questions. That was interesting. I'm, I'm curious, you know, have you looked at all of the systemic impacts of the sarcopenic obesity? So, for example, mm -hmm. you know, there's data to show that inflamed adipose tissue is biologically quite active in promoting oncogenic factors, et cetera. So, it may be the poor outcomes that we see in frail elderly patients is in part due to their physical state, but maybe in part due to systemic factors of know, pro-oncogenic factors, anti-immune factors, et cetera. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the systemic aspects. Yeah, of um, yeah they definitely play together. So um, like this part um, of the biological background, that would be the cachexia um, that is very prevalent um, in, in cancer patients. It's a very big part of the sarcopenia, but um, this is just for the cancer and sarcopenia, it's like the combination of age and uh, the cancer influence. Right. Any thoughts on, on anabolic steroids for these patients? So mm -hmm. we see weightlifters use these steroids and they get mm -hmm. incredibly large muscle mass. Yeah. What about yeah. elderly that patients? That was investigated, for example, for mm -hmm. testosterone, but um, like the studies showed that the muscle mass increased, but not the strength of the mass. Uh, the strength of the muscle, sorry. Mm -hmm. Just the mass. And that so it's possible that increased mm -hmm. muscle mass without yeah. increased strength. Mm -hmm. For what kind of response? Inflammatory response associated. Um, I could imagine like um yeah, interleukin six and CRP elevation. Not specific ones. Judy. Um, um looked or anybody looked at uh did these metrics that are more specific to sarcopenia, do they add anything to kind of established frailty scores like ECOG status or things like that? Like, do they actually like clinically add value to some established kind of metrics of patient performance? Um, yeah, I, um, so if they have been combined in a model, yeah, so if you use, like, I mean, you mentioned it as a biomarker, so, you know, a gold standard biomarker study is you take a base model and then add your novel marker to the base model to see if it adds anything. I think 
Um, probably not both in the same model because they are very related and um, I would either choose just including one one of those, either um, the component of psychopenia or ECOC or ASA. Judith, can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, I just had a question. Given that bariatric surgery doesn't really impact muscle mass, what is the effect of bariatric surgery in this population? I mean, this has been muscle content as we age. It's been really studied in fitness, you know, and, and, and frailty and fractures and many other things that you can be um, elderly, skinny, and frail um, because of the lack of muscle mass. Um, how is the bariatric surgery really affect this and also related to the systemic biomarkers as well, if you have any knowledge of that? Um, yeah, so it would be um, like a drastic reduction of the fat mass um, and uh, a very fast reduction probably. Um, which is, could be better in these patients because if they try um, to lose weight with calorie restriction over longer term, it's also the crosstalk with the bone and um, they, they could lose um, bone, um, like bone density as well if they try to um, do that. Um, but it's surgery and it's um, yeah, like a more intervention. So patients need to be counseled. Either they want to try for a longer term losing weight with calorie restriction and physical exercise or go straight to the, to the surgery. But it's more like a last line option. Does that answer your question? No, I'm more interested in, in the outcomes. I don't think it's the same to have a lower BMI than to have bariatric surgery, especially in light of no changes in your muscle component um, in line with your lecture. I just wonder if the outcomes that you see for oncologic outcomes make a difference if you just have bariatric surgery. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware if there's really a study investigating us with bariatric surgery and if they have difference in, in outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, for the rest of this. So we're just having some of the, the folks that uh, are in my research uh, group present today some of their findings for 10 minute presentation. So um, first, um, Emily, are, are you there? Hi, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So, so Emily is a third year Cornell student. Uh, she, she was awarded one of the uh, New York Academy Valentine uh, fellowships as a, as a second year resident. And uh, she's put together some of the data regarding outpatient uh, robotic assisted radical prostatectomy. All right, so thank you for the introduction, Dr. Hu. Um, again, my name is Emily. I'm a third year medical student here at Cornell. So today I'll be talking about outpatient versus inpatient robot assisted radical prostatectomy. Slide, please. So the national cost of prostate cancer care was about 18.5 billion in 2020, and that number continues to rise each year. Given the high cost of healthcare in the United States, in the past few years, there's been a trend in calculating and analyzing these costs through a method called time-driven activity-based costing. And the goal of this is to understand and move towards value-based health. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, we began doing robot-assisted RP outpatient instead of inpatient here at NYP in order to free up hospital beds for COVID patients. So there's existing literature that's demonstrated outpatient robot-assisted RP to be safe, and feasible and to have similar mortality and morbidity outcomes as inpatient RP. And as restrictions on inpatient surgeries were lifted at our hospital, we started offering patients the choice to do inpatient or outpatient. And we found that the majority of patients actually still wanted to do outpatient RP and go home the same day. 
So for this study, our aim was to assess how this transition from inpatient to outpatient robot-assisted RP impacted the healthcare costs and what it means for the future of outpatient RP. Next slide, please. So uh, when comparing the outpatient to the inpatient groups, we primarily looked at these three arms. Uh, first was complications, so complications within 30 days of surgery. Second was the time-driven activity-based costing for TDABC for short. Um, and then third was patient satisfaction with the surgery. So for these three categories, we compared the inpatient to outpatient groups to see if there were any differences. Next slide. Moving on to methods. So we captured a total of 225 robot-assisted RPs performed here at NYP and Dell Medical Center in Austin over the past two years. Of these 225, about 80 were inpatient and 145 were outpatient. Um, we recorded variables such as patient demographics, ASA classifications, complications that occurred within 30 days of surgery. And we also got the time spent in each step of the procedure from the anesthesia record. To assess patient satisfaction, we administered the standardized um, questionnaire when they came back for their catheter removal appointment, usually about a week after. Next slide. Okay, so moving on to some of our results. Here are the results for our 30-day complications. Um, we stratified the, the complications using the Pravian Dindo scale, and we found no significant difference in the complication rate for inpatient and outpatient RP. Of the two Clavian level three complications, one was a symptomatic lymphocele that had to be drained by IR, and the other was a port site hernia that was laparoscopically repaired. Um, in the table on the right, we can see we did a multivariable analysis for inpatient versus outpatient, uh, BMI, race, ASA class, and age, and we also found no significant association with the complication rate. Okay, so here is the time-driven activity-based cost analysis, um, which we calculated using the time spent in each step of the procedure and then the per unit per minute cost of each resource used for the procedure. So on the table on the right, you can see the total cost breakdown for each type of surgery. And outpatient surgery turned out to be about 13.5% cheaper for a total of almost 1,400 US dollars. So if you think about the number of radical prostatectomies that are performed each year, this could have potentially a really large compounding um, effect. Slide. Okay, so here are some of the results from our patient satisfaction survey. So this survey had 18 questions. Patients were given these questions and then they were able to answer each question by giving a number on a scale of one to one, zero to 100. A higher score represented a stronger feeling about a question and then a lower score or vice versa. So we found no significant difference in median survey scores between the inpatient and outpatient groups. Next slide. So this is the same information as the previous slide, but in bar graph form. Um, just to summarize, overall people were happy with the pain control medications, both inside the hospital and at home. Um, they gave low scores for the medication side effects, and they seemed satisfied overall for the surgery um, for both inpatient and outpatient groups. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so to summarize some of our results, we found a significant cost reduction associated with outpatient robot-assisted RP while maintaining similar patient satisfaction and complication rates. And so if all other factors are the same while costs have been reduced for this procedure, then it means that we have improved the value of robot-assisted RP by transitioning it from inpatient to outpatient. Um, given these results and the popularity for outpatient RP at our hospital, um, this means it could we think it could potentially become the new standard of care moving forward. That's all I have. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Emily. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, so, so let's talk. A quick question, question on, yeah. Yeah, on that. So obviously, this was not a randomized study, right? So there's obviously going to be some bias in who you discharge and who you keep overnight. And the question is, does that bias impact outcomes here? It, and it's reflected, you know, your you can use maybe the length of surgery as a 
marker of that. I was thinking the same thing um, because it was the procedures that were in that it were inpatient were longer procedure. It took longer to do the surgery. So you, um, most back. likely, which is normal, you're selecting out healthier people to do outpatient surgery, but it's, it's kind of a nice initial um, look at this transition. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, those are great points. It's certainly not randomized, and there's probably biases inherent in who gets inpatient and outpatient. I think what we've done after the COVID restrictions have been lifted is just to largely, again, I mean, this is retrospective, so there's biases, but largely give patients the choice of whether they want inpatient or outpatient. And we're finding that that's, it's probably about 80% that prefer an outpatient approach. I think the other things that are relevant in this slide are, are really the PACU stay. Let's see, do we have it in this one? Yeah, PACU is yes. longer for the outpatients, and that's, that was driven by just trying to get a second dose of Toradol before they go home. And I think if we show the data over time, that's gone down just because we're giving the first Toradol right when we insert the, the varus needle so that then the waiting six hours, you know, at the end of the case doesn't doesn't uh, slow things down. Um, but I, I think that this just, you know, sets the stage for, uh, you know, not not my decision, but getting that single port robot over to DHK and and at least trying to do some of these over there. Data on what the actual reimbursement is the two approaches. So I don't, Peter, um, but I'm told that that basically it's the, the hospital sees the same amount. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's like that, uh, what is it, the till midnight or some sort of rule like that, but, but I'm told that, that they've looked at this, but otherwise if, if we got less or they got less, I, I don't think they'd allow this. That care should be the same. I'm going to turn to me. Yeah, is Medicare they, is the one they, that actually. they pay like a global for the procedure, regardless if they stay or not? Less than two midnight. Right. Yes. So, so Peter said for Medicare, it should be the same, but maybe for some of the private insurances, it may differ. So Emily or, or Jim, like the, um, seeing no differences between complications and patient satisfaction, like what's your hypothesis for how much difference you would need to see for it to be clinically significant? And could you ever actually power for that? So I think the, I think the answer to your question says that the, the questionnaire that we used was actually derived for, um, you know, I think we changed two items that, and it was used in the orthopedic literature as they compared uh, procedures that were moved to outpatient setting. And so I don't think that there has been a study saying, well, what's a clinically significant difference, right, in those satisfaction scores? That's a good point. Um, as far as the complications go, I mean, I, you know, there's obviously inherent biases, as we talked about, since it's not a randomized controlled trial. But, but you know, I think it just gets to, I mean, I welcome thinking about this, but it just gets into ethical concerns of, you know, if you were able to randomize, oh, you're going to have outpatient, you're going to have inpatient, right? When, in particular, when, you know, the, um, the standard is still inpatient surgery. Yeah, I'm just trying to think, like, how do you respond to the criticism that, like, you're just underpowered? You sure. see no difference because you're always underpowered, and it's not like a no difference. It's not a non-inferiority, like truly, it's just an underpower. So. No, absolutely. Yeah. I think that helps uh, helps to certainly to write that limitation section of the manuscript. Were there any readmissions? I think it was mainly that that port site hernia that we presented mm -hmm. in uh, M and M's, um, and then the I think the it, the, the other one, the uh, lymphocele, was on the inpatient side. I think that from this too, just as Alec transitions to his presentation in the multivariable analysis, age wasn't a significant, it wasn't significantly associated with complications, right? When we looked at our series and, and Aaron Laviana at Dell. Good morning, everyone. So I'll talk about a study looking at age and outcomes after a robotic assisted radical prostatectomy. The prior studies have demonstrated that obviously a surgery um, can impact urinary incontinence outcomes. Um, and relative to radiation, urinary incontinence may be higher earlier on after surgery. Studies have also shown that risk factors like age, BMI, comorbidity index, lust, and prostate volume as predictors of urinary incontinence after a radical prostatectomy. We've also seen that older men are less likely to be offered curative treatment for prostate cancer than younger men, and older men are less likely to receive surgery compared to radiation. Some of that may be patient selection, um, uh, patient preference, or a multitude of other factors, but may also be due to the fact that 
you know, as physicians, we think that older men are more likely to have these adverse outcomes after radical prostatectomy and are more, may be more likely to have complications as well. Um, new techniques, um, you know, have been developed and, and refined over the years um, to sort of attenuate some of these adverse effects, particularly on urinary incontinence, like retia sparing, anteropatial sparing, bladder neck sparing, and so forth. Uh, so the aim of our study here was to really look at uh, primarily the urinary incontinence outcomes between older versus younger men after radical prostatectomy and also look at uh, adverse event rates as well as oncologic outcomes between these two groups of people. Our hypothesis is that older age um, is not a significant predictor anymore of uh, worse urinary incontinence outcomes uh, after radical prostatectomy. Uh, so we performed a retrospective analysis of all men who underwent RP between 2015 and 2022, primarily between two surgeons at Cornell and, and Georgetown. Um, men were separated into two groups of either younger versus older men, less than 70 or older 70. Um, baseline uh, and post-operative functional outcomes were assessed using the EPIC CP questionnaire. Uh, we assessed adverse events at 30 days uh, using the Clavian Didno classification. And then oncologic outcomes included biochemical occurrence, time to biochemical occurrence, and lymph node involvement. Our multivariable analysis I looked at these um, uh, risk factors primarily because of their prior association with uh, urinary incontinence. So overall, we had 919 patients that underwent RP, um, and of that, we had around 773 patients uh, with treatment data, separated out into 601 patients that were classified as younger and 172 that were classified as, as older. Overall, looking at their baseline demographics, we did find that there were significant differences in the baseline demographics across these patients, and including you know, their location of surgery. So more older men were treated um, here versus at, at Georgetown. Um, BMI was also significantly different, and uh, older men tended to have higher risk uh, prostate cancer. Looking at some of the perioperative data, we did not find any significant differences within the treatment-related data. So in the proportions of men who underwent standard technique versus rescue sparing were, were relatively similar. And the men who underwent nerve sparing or uh, partial slash non-nerve sparing were about the same as well. at their complications that we found no significant differences in the uh, complications, overall complication rate, as well as between the different um, clavin dindo classifications between younger and, and older men. When we compared their uh, urinary incontinence outcomes, we looked primarily at the urinary incontinence composite score, the epic CP, as well as the total score, the epic CP. So older men did have a significantly higher uh, median um, incontinence scores uh, at baseline, but not necessarily total scores. But then at 12 months, um, we found that there was no significant differences um, in the urinary incontinence score. And the total scores were, was trending towards significance with a p-value of 0.05. Um, we performed a Cox proportional hazard model for looking at um, the effect of age and the other factors with relation to either functional outcome, which is zero to one pad, or total continent, which is zero pad. So increasing age was associated with a decreased risk of functional co continence. And then age, uh, at least, it did not reach statistical significance for, um, uh, for, uh, in terms of reaching the outcome of, of total continence. Other um, findings included that retia sparing approach was significantly associated um, with return of, of total continence. On a multi, multiple linear regression model for retia sparing and, and these various covariates, um, we found that age and baseline epic CP scores, as well as retia sparing, uh, was significantly associated with 12-month um, epic total CP scores. However, when we looked specifically at the incontinence score, the epic CP questionnaire, age was no longer significantly correlated uh, with, with those outcomes. We have also performed a logistic regression, looking at outcomes of uh, functional and total incontinence. And within those uh, models as well, age was not significantly associated um, with um, total or functional continence. When we looked at oncologic outcomes, we did find that there were higher rates of, of uh, grade, group, grade group three, four, or five disease in the older men population, and as well as higher rates of T3 disease in older men. But no, there were no significant differences in biochemical occurrence, lymph node involvement, or positive surgical margins between these two. So overall, um, you know, this is obviously a retrospective analysis, and that the populations are not evenly split between these two groups, and there was a lot smaller sample size than the older population. 
and there, there was significant you know variation within the dem demographics between these two groups as well and obviously there's some other um, you know, uh, biases that we can't really account for within a retrospective study but overall our results do show that age may not play as significant effect on recovery of urinary incontinence symptoms at one year after about a spostectomy and that older and younger men have similar rates of complications uh, after surgery. Thanks, Alex. So this is, this is really the kind of the challenge, the, the paradigm. Um, I think that that, uh, rightfully so, carried over from open surgery, right? Like if you typically saw someone who's older than 70 and, and also per the task force screening guidelines, right? You typically stop, stop screening at the age of 70 or above. You know, so I think there's traditionally been a bias against surgery towards older men. And so we wanted to just dig deeper and see if some of these these um the, the the main outcomes were true. I didn't. I don't think you presented potency outcomes, but they're probably. I mean, I'm sure they're worse than older men. Yeah, I didn't present potency, but they are worse than older men. What percent was there a difference in the percentage of men having rectus sparing in the over 70 versus under? Um, uh, no significant difference. No. I mean. That second point, that age is not associated with continence recovery, runs counter to everything that's in the literature. So how do you interpret, how do you frame that in your findings in the context of everything, you know, decades of literature on this? I, if you look at age as a rather than dichotomous. Yeah, in the multivariable analysis, we use age as a continuous variable, yeah. I. I'm not totally sure. I think because there's a, a significant proportion of these men who have um, who had rectus sparing, like to me that's maybe the biggest factor. I, I don't know if there's also like refinements and technique that have developed over the years that we can't really account for within this study. But um, those are, those are my main you know reasons to think that. It could be the one area I, I don't I didn't see you look at is prostate size. Oh yeah. So um, No, so prostate volume was accounted for within our model. Um, you don't list what the volume was there, do you? I think it's continuous, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's continuous, yeah. Right. And I think, Chris, I, I think perhaps it could be that, you know, they're looking at one-year continence rate. So I'm sure if you looked at three- or six-month continence rate, continence. Right, right, there may be a significant difference. That one year, maybe all that yeah. evens out. Right. Just in general, anytime your findings run counter to the dogma in the literature, you have to think about that and frame that. Because again, otherwise you're just presenting something and it could be your data is bad, you know, and you gotta kind of look at that. It could be you're looking at the wrong readouts. Or like the readout that's not too long, which is right. fine. Continence at one year is important, definitely. Like yeah. that, if that's the point, that's a big point. I mean, I don't know if it makes a difference because on the multivariable model, age was significantly associated with um, worse continence at three months. But it's not necessarily a 12 months here. And that, so. that that might be the again, that might be something you actually want to present because that right. will make reviewers more comfortable that your data isn't terrible, right. basically. You know what I mean? I think the other thing you want to consider is um so so I we always typically think about you know zero to one pads or zero pads as you presented it, and then you have the score, right? In this case, which is you add up the three items and a higher score is worse outcome. But if you look at the different items for the FXCP for urinary control, it's, you know, the pad use is included, then it's total control, occasional dribbling, frequent dribbling, right? And then there's also how much of a problem is this? And so, so my point here is, is that if you showed this to someone like Andrew or a biostatistician, they'd say, you're running all these comparisons, you know, looking at different outcomes, you, you may have to do, you know, although it's the same outcome, you may have to do an adjustment for multiple comparisons, right? And so. So I think that you're probably better off, I mean, it's all framing, but you're probably better off presenting the, the score. I mean, that's the whole reason, like, I mean, Litwin originally did his, you know, UCLA Prostate Cancer Index to make it zero to 100. So it's a continuous score and it's not just pad-based because everyone has different thresholds for using pads, right? And the other, the only final element would be, which we heard about this weekend, is functional urethral length MRI, whether that could be measured or you have that data. Unfortunately, we don't have that data. Yeah, we just had everything else. So. Yeah, we have to try to say to Dan, why don't we put this in like they do at Memorial, right. but there's resistance. And yeah. It probably takes an extra 10 seconds. At large tables where you put boxes on the I've seen the data 100 times, Alex, but you try to table without outlining what you're talking about. Hello, everyone.
everyone. Um, I'm going to be presenting on prostate cancer, tumor volume, and genetic risk. Um, this was actually a topic that was discussed quite a bit at the Marshall. Um, I know Dr. Barbieri has published some work. Um, so in the most recent, um, probably last year's guidelines, the most recent ones, I think, um, they basically mentioned that active surveillance is preferred for most patients. However, uh, the panel recognized that there's heterogeneity across this risk group in total saying that active or definitive treatment might be recommended um, for patients with a higher PSA density, a higher number of positive scores on biopsy greater than three, or a higher genomic risk score um, from tissue-based molecular tumor analyses. And that basically means the cipher oncotype post-biopsy biomarkers, as well as a known uh, BRCA2 germline mutation. And speaking to what Dr. Barbieri was saying just a second ago about what's the precedence for cancer volume or tumor volume in prostate cancer being prognostic for um, mortality, metastasis, or adverse pathological effects on prospectum specimen. I was looking back into the literature, and you can see going back to 1999 and a lot of literature published by FC in 1994 and the 90s, there was a lot of correlation with cancer volume as being predictive of worse progression, current metastasis, so on and so forth. However, there was also quite a few publications kind of stating other, so otherwise. So in this bottom one by Walters and Boss, tumor volume did not add the prognostic value to routine mean set pathologic parameters. So there is some discordance in the literature. Um, and at this study, this issue has not been really studied recently at all, especially in the context of new novel geno genomic markers. It seems like my patient didn't really work. But, um, Most relevant for this was just kind of, you know, I think you showed those NCN, NCCN guidelines of, of um, someone, an uh, uh, active surveillance candidate with grade group one disease, right, if they have a lot of cores positive. Right, exactly. So the issue of high volume grade group one disease is a particular one we took. Um, this over here uh, was very interesting to me, and it kind of, I'm very interested in how these guidelines get implemented in community practice and across this country. This is from the Music Collaborative, and this is looking at a panel of the community-based and academic urologists in Michigan across, I think, 20 different clinics. And they're asking where was their consensus and where was this, their discordance among treating or recommending patients for active surveillance. And as you can see over here in the light blue um, boxes, that's where the greatest agreement lies. So for low volume grade group one disease for non-African American and African American patients, there was almost universal agreement, but as you got to higher volume grade group one disease and into low volume grade group uh, two disease, you can see that there's definitely increased uh, disagreement. And that other figure I showed basically just reiterated that same thing, um, which I can show in a second if there's any questions. What we did was we worked with uh, Decipher and Verisite, um, and we took out um, about 40,000 patients who received prostate biopsies and looked at their Decipher scores. Um, and correlated it with percent positive course uh, on analysis, looking at a specific regression term, including an interaction effect between grade group um, and genomic classifier score. Um, and on the left, as you can see in the figure, it was correlating uh, genomic classifier score, which is just a correlate for decipher, as well as percent positive cores. And it was, and it's kind of reflected in the multivariable analysis on the right that you can see that with increasing genomic classifier score. Uh, grade group two, grade group three, grade group four, and grade group five are correlated with increasing numbers of percent positive cores. However, for grade group one disease, which is, um, and specifically with the clinical issue of high volume grade group one disease, you can see that it's essentially flat, um, indicating that, and this is not correlated, but the biggest limitation of the study, obviously, is we do not have pathologic features. We do not have RP specimen. We don't have things that are going to be related after the prostatectomy, but associated with this, you can have a little bit more confidence if you want to keep a patient with high volume grade group one on active surveillance with continual decipher scores. And just, just to clarify, Ash, can you explain on the y-axis how that's derived? I mean, most people probably know that. But. Oh, yeah. So on the y-axis, so the percent positive cores, um, and I'll go back to the NCCN guidelines because they kind of mentioned greater than three. Um, and this is, this is a big issue regarding how you kind of classify what's high volume, what's intermediate volume, what's low volume. So in the original Epstein criteria, as well as modifications off the Epstein criteria, which are used in a lot of active surveillance cohort studies across this country, 
they, they usually only include patients with low percent positive pores, which is typically less than three. Between three and six or three and five is what you consider intermediate volume, and greater than five or half, um, more than 50 percent percent positive pores is what you consider to be high volume. Um, the interesting thing about this is that most active surveillance studies in this country, there's probably about these cohorts that have been studied continuously, including at Hopkins, I believe at Michigan and a few other sites, they almost exclusively exclude patients with high volume disease at upfront and at baseline. And they've done some other studies looking at whether these active surveillance recommendations can be extended to patients with higher volume disease. And they said, yes, they could, and this is in support of that. All right, so going to your graph, so question. So first of all, how did you, how do you account for MRI targeted biopsies and how that includes the number of cores? Because that's a big That's a big limitation, yeah. I, I, when we talked to the Verisite people and we were trying to figure out whether these patients got MRIs, how many cores were actually taken, were they like 20 cores, were they 12 cores, um, they basically said that we were not able to kind of derive that information, um, which is a limitation for sure. Um, number of patients that have a high genomic risk score for one disease has to be very small. So it isn't actually. Um, I, I wish I had the other figure, but it was approximately 7,000 patients um, or so uh, were in that category. Um, so that, that was one of the criticisms we had when we submitted it for review. When we broke it out, there's actually a significant number of both men who have altogether high volume grade for one disease, but also uh, African American men with high volume grade for one disease. Not, I believe, one of their concerns was it was underpowered for analysis. Right? Ash, um, is, is volume is not just the number of cores, but the percent in each core, correct? Yes, yes, and, and that's, that's another um, limitation. That's a really good point. So the, uh, just to kind of bring it out and, and, and ex, uh, expand on that. So you can have a core with only 10% of the entire total core length that has cancer but that would be considered a positive core. However, they typically also report the amount of that core that's involved. And that was also not included over here because that would include um, some sort of central pathologic review. Um, so, so yes, that was absolutely another limitation we included in the study. And the other, yeah, the other confounder, and I have no idea how to sort of deal with it or even think about it, but so if you've got for most um, grade group two and higher, there can often be multiple cores, but often one of them, particularly in grade group two, will be like the grade group two and mm -hmm. will be the rest will be all grade group one, basically. Yeah. Whereas if you've got 10 cores of grade group one, yeah. the pathologist choosing which one to actually send for the decipher. Yeah is a confounder. Do you know what I mean? I know, absolutely. If there's three of grade yeah. group one and one of grade group two, they they know exactly which one they're sending. Right. So again, I don't know how to account for that or how that that affects things, but I think it does affect things. I, I you know think I, mean? I asked um, Eli about that question, like how are they, like when you get a biopsy. Pathologist choice. Exactly. That's yeah. going to be a confounder in every grade group. Yeah. Right, but, but in, but it's rare, it's, there's more uniformity. There's more uniform. Yeah, exactly. You have it's basically if you if you've got ten cores of grade group one, they're all kind of the same. Like you're sort of choosing at random. To I mean, I think they choose the highest volume, but it, like they choose it random a little bit. You've got you know in a jar if there's two cores of grade group one and one core of three plus four with like ten percent right. pattern four, like that's the one that goes basically. You know I, where you gotta have. And to your point as well, like the like Cooperberg's publication in EU, the genomic landscape. Was, yeah. Demonstrates that you, you can't. Th those are all going to be maybe different when you send that to yeah, exactly. So it's exactly. kind of a who who knows it, right? right? Yeah, it's it's a really great point. I think the next point of study with this is when we actually have RP specimens. This will be linked with us here, um, and we'll be able to study this, looking at what actually comes out if these patients did go to radical prostatectomy. I mean, you could almost make the counter argument that. Um, Cipher or genomic classifiers are not that like we know that increasing positive core volume associated with worse final pathology. Like that's the gold standard. Mm -hmm. I think the argument you can make here is that the genomic classifier is least useful in the high volume grade group one because it's not increasing as we know the adverse
or spinophobology yeah. does. I, I, you know I see I mean? exactly what you kind mean. of flip that around a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Like in general, this yeah. is the this is the case, but in this specific like area, it's a subtle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I do think though, like, and, and this is just two representative examples, but there are many publications that have argued against percent positive scores of tumor volume actually being prognostic in general. And this is actually not an issue that's been studied recently at all. It's, these a lot of these publications are from prior to 2005, prior to the switch in pathology standards where grade group one and grade group two were kind of changed fundamentally in 2005. You also have a lot of patients in that 99 study who really. Right. Hello. Hey, have they run multi variables for the. the I've heard of the SEER yet? Uh, they. You can touch base with them, I think. Yeah. I think, I think Spratt just did that. Just like. Yeah. I think they're just <coughs> waiting. They're just waiting for that first paper to come out before we can do the now. Then at least you have the RP, the linked RP pathology. The question. That was my conclusion. Yeah. So Sophia, you have five minutes. I'll keep it brief. Thank you. Sophia is uh, one of the third-year medical students at Dell at University of Texas. Uh, she worked with Aaron Laviana and uh, is working with us as well. And going to talk about the learning curve for the, uh, the precision point transperineal biopsy. Thank you, Dr. Hu. Uh, good morning. My name is Sophia. I'm a third year medical student. I'll be presenting on the learning curve for in-office tr uh, cognitive transperineal freehand biopsy. Next slide. Um, so although the transperineal approach of prostate biopsy is still the dominant approach in the U.S., the transperineal approach has become a potential alternative due to low risk of infection. Um, of all the transperineal approaches, the cognitive freehand biopsy is the most cost efficient because it reduces the need for expensive targeting equipment. The reported rates of transperineal uh, uh, cognitive biopsy detection of prostate cancer have been comparable to that of uh, the transrectal approach. And additionally, the precision point device has been introduced to the market to make freehand transperineal biopsies less difficult to learn. Um, this stabilizes the needle and minimizes the number of punctures in the perineal skin. However, the learning curve for retaining accuracy may limit how much we can generalize published outcomes to a user unfamiliar with this approach. Next slide. So our objective was to examine the learning curve for the cognitive transperineal approach by assessing prostate cancer detection rates, biopsy results, patient reported outcomes, and complication rates. Next slide. We retrospectively reviewed all patients who underwent cognitive transperineal biopsy by a single urologist without prior experience in this approach for the last one and a half years. Patients were also asked to rate their pain and anxiety immediately after the procedure and then their seven day discomfort and complications on their follow up visit. Next slide. We included 110 patients, which were divided into 27 to 28 patients for a quarter of the study period. Only five patients with a history of partial gland ablation were excluded. Uh, we found no differences in baseline demographic and MRI characteristics. Um, and we currently only have reported procedure times for the third and fourth quarter, which showed a significant procedure time decrease to a median time of three minutes in the last quarter. Both the overall and the clinically significant prostate cancer detection rates did not change across the quarters, uh, with a clinically significant detection rate being approximately 50% in each quarter. The percent of fibromuscular cords within each bi biopsy was also minimal from the start, um, did not change across the study period, ranging from 0 to 6%. The only thing that changed was the total number of cores taken for biopsy, the significantly decreased across the study period from 18 cores in the first quarter to 16 and 15 cores in the later quarters. Next slide. There was also no significant differences in patient fear and anxiety immediately after the procedure across the study period. Additionally, their seven-day uh, median discomfort remained minimal from the first quarter, ranging from median score of one to three. Next slide. A majority of patients experienced temporary hematuria and hematospermia, but this did not change across the quarters. Other 30-day complication rates also remained very low and stable. 
The single patient in the third quarter with a UTI was a 66-year-old male who presented with urgency and frequency 10 days after his biopsy and his symptoms resolved with antibiotic treatment. Next slide. So in short, our study shows there's no significant learning curve for in-office freehand cognitive transperineal biopsy using the precision point device. We did see a decrease in the number of cores per biopsy after approximately 20 cases, as well as a decrease in total procedure time suggesting that uh, one becomes more proficient in this technique over time. But overall, this is a safe, effective, and well-tolerated procedure that may serve as an alternative to the transrectal approach. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. So on that patient that had the um, urinary tract infection, was there, do you, do you remember, was there ever a positive culture or is it just treated with antibiotics? Um, it was treated with antibiotics. These complication rates are patient reported, um, so he may not know whether it was a positive or negative uh, culture. Right. So, I mean, the, the other point is just that with the transperineals, we're not giving antibiotic prophylaxis, so that's also uh, an interesting point. Questions, comments? All right, thanks everyone. Thank you, everybody.